I'm going to get started with our topic for today. I'm thrilled to um, Elizabeth Aloni with Schneps Media. We are the largest local media outlet for news. We publish over 70 newspapers, magazines, and websites throughout Queens, Brooklyn, Westchester, Long Island, Manhattan, the Bronx, and um, are thrilled to do so. We provide uh, print, digital, email marketing, social media marketing, webinars, um, and beyond. And we're thrilled to be here with ListNet to sponsor uh, this Tech Talk this morning. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Trapani in a few minutes. I just wanted to inform you about our illustrious group of individuals who we are going to be able, who are gonna be presenting to you today. Um, first of all, we have Tyler Rowe. He is the CEO of eGifter. After co-founding and growing Envision.com Inc., one of the first and most innovative managed service providers in the country, Tyler and team successfully sold the fast-growing venture-backed company in 2007. The company was a pioneer in what has today become the omnipresent cloud service business. business. Tyler and the team went on to found eGifter, which provides innovative e-gift cards and digital gifting solutions. In his role as CEO of eGifter, Tyler has resumed his hands-on leadership style of orchestrating idea flow into actionable plans. Our other illustrious guest is Michael Ohayan. He's the COO of WebAir, and Michael is the COO of WebAir. He is New York's leading managed cloud and IT infrastructure solutions provider. Michael has over a decade of experience as a leader in the field of information technology. Overseeing all operations within the company, Michael excels at creating and cultivating high performance teams. He intuitively sees opportunities that wind through an organization and brings them together in a coherent whole. As the Chief Operating Officer, Michael has been an integral to the growth of the company, forging a unique path and inspiring change to develop action across all departments of the organization. With exceptional proficiency in decision making, developing strategic initiatives, and establishing governance boundaries, all processes and procedures throughout the organization have been streamlined under Michael's leadership. And last but certainly not least is our wonderful moderator, Paul Trapani, is an entrepreneur and consultant experienced in executive management, software design and development, business operations, and technology planning and strategy. He is the president of Long Island Software and Technology Network, ListNet, and runs software consulting company PJT Consulting. ListNet serves as a chamber of commerce for the tech industry on Long Island and works to create a strong technology ecosystem for all companies on Long Island. PJT Consulting helps clients translate business requirements into software. Paul holds bachelor degrees from SUNY G Geneseo, is that how we say it? <laughs> um, and masters in computer science from Hofstra University. He enjoys food and cooking in his free time and helped to create the app Eat Everywhere. So I welcome you gentlemen. Obviously we have a, a group of individuals who are very knowledgeable and are gonna bring forth a wonderful conversation. I'm gonna hand it off to Paul to moderate and um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you Elizabeth for uh, hosting and for uh, kicking this off. Uh, very glad to be here. Very excited to see that there's a good turnout. Um, I thought this was a good group because uh, eGifter and WebAir are two Long Island based companies, but they all also operate nationally and even beyond. And they're very active in the local community, but also active um, uh, with national and international presence as well. So I thought it would be interesting to see how they're doing and how they're handling the current situation. So I'm going to start with a few questions for each and we'll alternate back and forth between Tyler and Michael. Uh, so, uh, Tyler, Michael, welcome. Tyler, I'll start with you. Um, how is your team handling working remotely? Uh, take mute off. Tyler, you're on mute. That's a rookie mistake. <laughs> okay. um, well, hello, everyone. Hello, uh, and thank you, Elizabeth and Paul. Good morning, and hello, Michael and everyone on the call. Uh, thanks for taking the time to join today. Um, I think our team's faring uh, probably much like a lot of, uh, of, of other folks uh, at this point. Um, their um, the initial reaction, I think, was, 
we were a little concerned, you know, could we be efficient? How is this going to work? Um, you know, you know, we're a pretty technically savvy group. So, you know, dealing with, uh, you know, with, with uh, having the collaborative, you know, working with collaborative tools, we were already doing quite a bit of that. We use things like Slack on a day-to-day -day basis and, you know, jumping into a, um, a Microsoft uh, Teams meeting or a Google Hangout, which was a, was a pretty common thing for us. But we, um, um, it seemed that we got very quickly into a groove and um, it, 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 it actually, you know, looking back now over the past two months, it's pretty clear that our productivity is actually up, which is, which is odd. I'm not sure if it's a phenomenon mm -hmm. that will last through the good weather coming. Um, uh, you know, I think that uh, right now uh, during these couple of months, I do believe that there was a general sense among our team that uh, they were happy to be uh, in, employed in a, in a, in the type of a business mm -hmm. that, um, could potentially do okay in 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 the in, in the COVID challenged environment. It's not that we didn't have our challenges, but there was also maybe some opportunities. So overall, the team's really doing well. Uh, no, nobody's had a sick day in two months. Uh, so uh, maybe that's adding to the productivity. But uh, uh, overall, uh, adapting very well. And um, what what has changed in your industry when this pandemic emerged? Like, what what have you seen change? So eGifter has a couple of different parts to its business. So we have a part of our business where we just simply sell gift cards to consumers. Um, and we mostly digital gift cards, sometimes with, with sales or special offers. Um, did, we saw some trends there starting to emerge where folks were giving gift cards to maybe friends or family that, were, um, that, that, that maybe uh, were having financial challenges. So we started to see sort of the use case for some of the giving change. And that was an immediate phenomenon. We saw some people setting up group gifts for that. For our retailers, the ones that we power the gift card sales on their websites, we have a pretty broad array of those that we do it for. Brands like DSW, American Eagle, Abercrombie, um, other brands that like Tractor Supply, Carnival Cruise Lines, National Amusements Theaters, and in there a sampling of, of the best and the worst, right? You know, Carnival Cruise Lines, they're having their troubles, right? Not a lot of yeah. folks. Uh, having cruises right now, uh, national amusements, the movie theaters, you know, to showcase cinemas, they're having their challenges, of course. Um, but Tractor Supply is an essential business; they're doing fantastic. Um, and uh, um, some of our, some of the mall retailers and and, and big retailers like DSW, for example, uh, they've responded by trying to do more online business. So even though um, they're being impacted, um, we're seeing a fair amount of activity of gift card sales through the platform that we power. Um, so there's been positive and negative impacts, uh, but then we have a part of our business where we sell gift cards for incentive and reward use cases, meaning that they could be purchased in bulk by businesses. Sometimes they give them to employees. They maybe connect to us via API and give them out as game rewards. Uh, we're getting a lot of, um, not-for-profits and, and other types of organizations charted with, uh, you know, trying to maybe distribute, to distribute funds. Uh, using our using gift cards as a mechanism to get funds out to some folks who maybe some of the unbanked who aren't benefiting from you know, or don't have a mechanism to, to benefit from the stimulus because they don't have a bank account or maybe they don't work completely on the books uh, and gift cards has become a tool uh, for that. So that's where some of the opportunity emerged from. So it's been a mix. And as a company, we've had to sort of pivot into that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we did. You know, we, we looked at it and we said, you know, thankfully, we're not in a business that, you know, com was completely devastated by the current situation. Right. And, and um, so we, 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 we just, we just uh, uh, you know, started to market into some of the opportunities we saw emerging. That's great. I, I'm going to switch over to Michael. We'll come back to you, Tyler. Um, Michael, uh, obviously, WebAir has clients all over and does many different services for them. How has WebAir helped clients navigate some of the new normals brought on by COVID-19? Yeah, it's definitely been very interesting. You know, we've had a lot of customers that had this ideology that they were set up to work remotely, but then unfortunately, when it comes down to it, uh, they weren't really prepared. And, and a lot of it came around the inability to access systems and servers because maybe there wasn't enough bandwidth allocated to their systems, or maybe they just didn't have the proper DR strategy in place. So fortunately for us, you know, having a team that is very agile, there's multiple customers, we were able to get up and running, be prepared to work remotely. And then outside of that, we've actually seen some really great growth in our virtual desktop infrastructure product, which essentially allows people to, from any device, whether it be 
an iPad, a, a laptop, a, a desktop computer, doesn't matter really where you're accessing it from, allows you to, in a way, access your, your basically your desktop that you're used to, no matter what device you're on. Um, just to put that in, in kind of easier terms. And we've seen great growth in that product. We've actually signed up some credit unions and, and other uh, financial institutions that were just not prepared for their staff to not work in an office space. So it's been really great. We, we've seen some excellent growth in that category. And we've just had to be as agile as possible and, and help our customers as best as possible. Because, you know, as Tyler kind of mentioned, you know, we are, are fairly fortunate in, in the business that we have that we haven't suffered too much. You know, our, our services are still growing. Our customers still need our services because whether they're working in the office or they're remote, they still need to access their servers and systems. However, some of our customers that have those platforms um, aren't able to actually work remote. You know, it's just their business. Maybe they're manufacturing, maybe they're, you know, just some type of operation that cannot work remotely. So, you know, we've had to be as agile as possible, help our customers, uh, both from a, an operation standpoint, a financial standpoint, and do really anything we can just to make this time a little bit easier for them. So a lot of experts are saying that, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have this remote workforce and that, that we won't go back to the way things were at all. What are some of the things businesses should do to prepare to support this remote workforce, including VDI and anything else you might think? I think that there needs to be a preparation that companies are going to realize that this remote thing can work. Uh, and, and as Tyler mentioned, productivity, who knows why, but Weber as well, we see our productivity has gone up significantly. Our team is logging on earlier. They're staying on later. Now it could be, let's be very transparent. There's nowhere to go right now. Right. You can't, you can't go to happy hour. You can't go to a friend's house. You can't go to mom and dad's and you know, so it's uh, it's definitely very interesting, right? So maybe that's part of it. But, but, you know, there's been statistics for many, many, many years that shows remote companies, because this is not new. It's new for a lot of us. But there's plenty of companies that have adopted this remote culture, you know, one being actually our, our, our software partner, Veeam, who has well over 4,000 employees and has, I think, two centralized offices in the entire world. Otherwise, almost all their staff is remote. So you, you realize that it's possible to grow a business remotely it's just adopt, adopting new kind of culture and ways that you work and maybe tools. As Tyler mentioned earlier, there's Slack, there's all these, these tools that we can use to work together more collectively. So it's definitely going to continue. And I think it's going to continue for a multitude of reasons, employee satisfaction. Yes, we all crave that interaction of getting into a meeting and chatting, but look, we can do that digitally, right? It's a little different there. It's, it's not the same, but it's, it's possible. And for the employees and team members to not have to commute, the amount of money that they're saving, we have employees that come from the city, we have employees that obviously have leases on their cars that they're spending miles and miles of overages potentially commuting to the office for years or paying $400 a month for a train ticket. So I think it's going to be more common. And, I, I, and as you mentioned, yeah, the statistics are going to show that. But to do that, you just need to be set up successfully. And it's making sure that you're, you're giving your team the tools that they need to, to do this. And whether that's virtual desktop infrastructure where from anywhere they can log on to a, a, their desktop and work just as efficient as they did anywhere, whether it's making sure you have tools such as Slack or, or Zendesk, you know, very, very great communication tools for your team to stay in sync. And, and the number one thing outside of tools, right, talking about virtual desktop infrastructure, talking about cloud services, making sure you're your equipment is accessible anywhere is, is really just adopting a culture of keeping your team included. I think it's, it's going to become where people need to realize it's not the technology that's completely going to solve the problem. It's going to be the culture that's going to make sure that your organization can work remotely. That's an interesting angle. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's great. A lot of people, I think, don't, don't think of that part of it. Um, we'll come back to you again, Michael. I want to jump back over to Tyler. Tyler, I understand that eGifter launched a new initiative to help small businesses, and they certainly needed at this time um, how they could deal with the shutdown. Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so we um, we we kind of um, it, it was kind of opportunistic. We we sort of stumbled our way into uh, into into doing a, a project that's actually having a, a pretty significant impact. Um, eGifter as a company really services um, large retailers, so. 
we, we, the gift cards we sell to consumers, about 300 and change national, national and large regional brands, that we sell those same brands of gift cards into rewards programs. And like I was mentioning before, where businesses buy them. Um, and, um, and we, of course, the software we sell, we had powers, the gift card experiences, all big brands. And we, we were looking at, uh, last year we started looking at the small, the small medium business market and we started gathering um, all of the, the, the different, um, uh, we, 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 we built some robotic crawlers and we did what we, you know, we internally call growth hacking, trying to get a handle on the industry. We gathered about 50,000 pages of gift cards just so we could see all the small businesses that had gift cards around the country, what platforms that they were using, what their user experiences looked like, who the, who the players were. And when, at the end, we came to the conclusion that, um, we weren't ready to start servicing the small and medium businesses directly. We've actually been working through um, through gift card um, and payment processors that provide uh, services to small businesses and, and powering it more at that level. So we don't really have a solution to help small businesses, but here we were sitting on this database. And when I say a database, it was a link directly to the gift card landing page for a bunch of small brands. So pick the name of a, a you know prime restaurant, but not Prime Restaurant's homepage, Prime Restaurant's gift card landing page. And, the, and, and that goes on and on. So we said, what can we do with this database? And we said, well, what if we just put up a free directory of, of gift cards? And um, we came up with this idea and this name, OperationMainStreet.com. We put it together. And then the ideas just started triggering. It was like, well, what if we were to put, it, put, uh, put together a, a way you could sort by state? And wait a minute, maybe you could sort by county Clearly, you need to be able to search by zip code. So the next thing we knew, we had a directory for every state, county, town, zip code. We had a map overlay on the, on, on the search. And then we, we were getting a lot of inquiries coming in from municipalities asking what we could do to help with gift cards. And we, we didn't have an answer. This is part of what drove, uh, drove it. We, we, don't, we don't have a solution to help um, the, the businesses. But now we were able to say, you know what? We built you a page. Here you go. Um, here you go, uh, Shreveport, you know, uh, Louisiana. Here's a here's a page that you can use. And you know what? While we're at it, uh, we'll take the logo for Shreveport. We'll put it on the page for you. And then Chambers of Commerce started to come in. And the next thing you knew, we were doing it um, for Chambers of Commerce and, and municipalities all around the country. Suffolk County launched a program called Suffolk Forward, which is all about, uh, so Steve Ballone drove this, um, all about what's the future going to look like. And it's a five-part initiative to help businesses recover after the shutdowns and our gift card page is one piece of this to help them survive during the shutdown and, and recover after the shutdown. Um, so it's been happening. Um, there's a, a, the, the Queens Chamber of Commerce got very involved and uh, they've been promoting it in, in their area. And I guess we have about a hundred or so that have, you know, everything from states to counties, to towns, to chambers of commerce that are taking it on and promoting it. And we're thinking it's going to grow to thousands. The database has swelled to over 60,000 now. Um, companies. So, so they use your, your technology platform, but they could maintain and they could you do the promotion. And they no, could... there's, we don't, they're not even using our platform. All we are is a free directory wow. call where we are linking through to their sites. We have no revenue model for it. It's really just, you know, someday maybe we'll be able to service these <laughs> businesses. Right now it's, it, it became, it, it was a pet project that, um, again, we felt like because we had gone through that effort to gather those links, we said, how can we sit on this database of links? You know, it was like our own little secret database that we were going to use to figure out the industry and, and, and make some, you know, moves to go, to go, get, to go down that's, market. Yeah. That's fantastic that you guys are doing that. Um, yeah. and, the, and the man hours wasn't bad, Paul. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> great when you can find a balance between being able to do something good and right. it doesn't put you out of business doing it. Right. I mean, this was. You know, I want to say maybe we have 150 or 200 man hours into it in total. Yeah. It's not bad to be able to do something this significant. So, we've so done. in addition to that, what have you done to keep the revenue flowing for your business? You get yeah, well, that's 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 where the rest of those those hours <laughs> went, and, uh, uh, and 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 uh, and that many hours in a week it seems sometimes. Uh, 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 but we've done a few things. So. Um, we, we have a thing we call the e-gifter choice card and we sell the e-gifter choice card um, and we have a, a, a version we sell to consumers. They can give it as a gift and then the recipient can choose. And then we have a, a version we sell for employee and, and other types of rewards. We call the e-gifter rewards, rewards choice card. 
And when, when, when this, ha and that, that's a card that let's say um, that's used by companies like UPS. So if you earn points uh, shipping packages on UPS, you'll earn an e-gifter powered UPS rewards choice card. And that UPS rewards choice card gives you the ability to then cash in the points that you earn um, on um, on whatever brands of gift cards are available in the UPS the UPS branded environment that we power. So those types of programs are great. We said, well, what can we do that's 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 specific for this for the time? We created something we call the eGifter Essentials Choice Card, and that was limited to a very small amount of like truly essential brands like. Um, you know, Walmart and, and CVS and Target and, and a bunch of others, you know, and, and delivery things like Uber Eats and DoorDash. And we put together a, a, a batch of those cards and we, uh, we branded it the eGifter Essentials Choice Card. And we've been selling it to relief organizations who've been giving it out. Um, on the, on, and then we did the same thing on the consumer facing website. We, de we developed a, 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 a streaming gift card, the mm -hmm. eGifter Streaming Choice Card, and another one called the eGifter Takeout Choice Card. And we sold, and, and again, instead of being rede redeemable for every brand on our site, it's redeemable for all the brands that offer takeout and, um, or all the brands that offer streaming. And, um, and we give a little discount on it. And uh, very much geared around what people are looking for now and being able exactly, to use it. Exactly, exactly. And we marketed into that. We did some social, we did some, we did some marketing for the, for the, for the business ones. We did some, you know, we did emailings and phone calling to, you know, to relief organizations and other types of things. So that was, that was, that was our pivot into it. And that has really, uh, uh, really paid off. Um, and what's nice is that we feel like we're doing, even in that part of it, we feel like we're doing good things to sort of help help folks right. in the pandemic, uh, but it's also, you know, good, healthy business for us as well. That's great. That's great. Excellent. Um, I want to come back to Michael because obviously we're all working remote now and, um, you know, years ago people wouldn't even have heard what a VPN was, but a lot of companies think, well, I have this VPN and my workers are just on the VPN and connecting like that. But why would they want to look at VDI as a way to be more cost effective and a more a better solution for security and everything else, Michael. Like, why? Why isn't you know just the way people are set up now enough? Sure. So, so VDI really gives you the opportunity to kind of centralize your desktop management. You know, it, traditionally, let's just take an example. You have a new employee that starts, and then you generally have to go to your IT team, whether you have an internal one or you use maybe an outsourced MSP. And now, you know, you say, "Hey, I just hired uh, John Smith." all right, I need a new laptop for him. We need to configure this laptop. We need to install all these applications for him. We need to make sure when we hand off this laptop, we have everything he needs. And that can take hours for somebody to sit there and download this, this application, download this, configure his username, configure his password, install some security software. It's, it's a pretty daunting task. And what VDI does is essentially, uh, it's one template for everybody. So you deploy your initial template and it's simply, I can just give them a laptop and say, here's your laptop. I just bought it from Best Buy. It doesn't matter where you got it from. Here it is. Go ahead and put your username and password in. And then I sim simply give them a username and password to the VDI environment. And they go to a URL. They just type in a URL on their browser. Uh, let's just say it's, uh, you know, workingfromhome.webair.com. They type that in and they put their username and password they were given. And they are now loaded on a desktop, which took about 10 minutes to deploy um, from somebody basically just adding a new user to the system. And then that desktop automatically deploys from your template. All your applications are installed. And it gives you increased in security, right? Because now you have centralized control over your, uh, essentially your employee's desktop at that point. And whenever there's a patch or you need to update Windows or you need to add a new application, you essentially add it to the master image and that will push out to every single employee. And now when you start using Slack for your organization, let's say, or some type of communication tool, you simply add that to the, the master image and we click a few buttons and now all of your employees have that application the next time they log in. So from a manageability standpoint, from a security standpoint, it gives you more centralized control. Your employees can log in from centrally anywhere. Let's say they went on vacation and they forgot their laptop at home, but that vacation house has a desktop or some type of iPad, you name it, they can now access their desktop. So, you know, the VPNs are great and they, and they work, but now when you have a VDI solution, you know, we integrate that with all your systems and tools so that you don't need to worry about having a VPN. You can actually just log in directly with, to that system 
Um, and there's obviously a lot of nuances we can get into. You but, don't have to worry uh, if uh, the person has the wrong version of Windows and the software doesn't run and how do they install all this stuff and then all stuff that just takes time and effort to get going. You know? That's exactly what it is. It, it really can reduce. We actually just did a VDI webinar yesterday. Um, the statistics show that you can improve your productivity from a deployment standpoint by over 50%. So for your team to get a new device or a laptop and, and just think about, you know, laptops fail or computers fail. So imagine if your employee calls you up and just says, hey, you know, my computer's not working anymore. Uh, it won't turn on. You know, if you have an arsenal of laptops, you can simply just turn around and say, here, not a problem, John. Let me give you a new laptop. And John's ready to go. And you don't need to worry about redeploying an entire desktop again. Excellent. Um, now, what about why would someone want to use a VDI provider like WebAir rather than trying to do this themselves? <laughs> so few reasons. It's, it's not easy and it's not cheap to do it on your own. You know, if you were to do it on your own, you have to supply a significant amount of hardware, everything from potentially switches to servers to storage servers, you name it, there's a lot that goes into it. And it's not a very simple thing to set up. It's as, as ideal as it would be to be uh, able to just click a button and, and deploy all of this. There's so much more that goes into it. It's the connectivity between your current systems and your, your now VDI infrastructure. It's the installing and configuring the software best that's gonna work for your, your team. There's just a lot of overhead that goes with it that it will generally probably end up costing you a lot more to do it yourself than to do it with a provider who's gonna put it in a redundant data center, such as one of our eight locations globally, somebody who's gonna be able to watch it 24 seven, monitor it 24 seven. When you have a slowness issue, you have a problem, you call the provider. Uh, it's just a, a much easier thing to do than to try to do this on your own. I can assure you in the grand scheme of things, it will become a much more expensive project if you do it uh, on your own and not through a provider. One thing that I've, I've had a few conversations with people about it, and I think they neglect to realize the licensing, not just paying for the Windows licensing and software licensing, but how are you managing that and being sure you're in compliance? And if you're not, you could get hit with a pretty hefty bill from Microsoft or someone else. So I guess through you guys, you help them manage yep. all that. Yeah. We take care of all of it. We take care of the management, the licensing, the monitoring. It's, it's one bill, uh, one, one person to call, and we take care of all of that. You know, and also being a service provider, truth be told, we buy in bulk. So we generally get better rates than somebody that can go direct to a VMware or a Microsoft or whoever that might be because we actually were part of certain programs that we can generally provide a benefit for. So when you go direct to these, these companies, such as the Microsoft, so VMware, they're actually going to probably charge you a lot more than we're going to end up charging you in the grand scheme of things. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. That was, that was very informative. And uh, I think it's going to be something that's going to be more in demand. Um, question for both of you. I'll start with Tyler. What, uh, what are your plans for coming back to the office or going forward or, or the new, the new normal, as they say? Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, um, definitely, uh, you know, trying to figure out what the Suffolk County, uh, rules and timeline is going to be, um, you know, as, as, as you know, but not everyone here knows, uh, you know, myself and the other founders of eGifter, we also operate Launchpad Huntington. So it's not just us coming back to work. There's 28 companies that call Launchpad Huntington home. I'm getting a lot of calls with people with different thoughts. I mean, as you can imagine, people have different timelines in their minds. Some folks are saying, I'm not coming out for quite some time. And others are saying, I, I want to come back now. Um, so, you know, we're, we're working on trying to find the balance. Um, we're also trying to do some things in the office, like, um, you know, do some reconfigurations of desk arrangements to try to get a little bit more social distancing and maybe do some, um, um, some 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 tape or other types of things on the floor. There's all sorts of things that you can buy now that are um, that 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 can help you uh, uh, create socially distanced parameters in 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 retail spaces and office environments. And so we're going to need to spend a little bit of both time and money to get to get to get that 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 set up. Um, but I would say that you know from a timing standpoint, it certainly doesn't look like the Gifter team will be back in the office in June. Uh, and uh, again, with the productivity where it is currently, uh, and again, I'm not, I don't, I'm not hundred percent certain that we'll be able to maintain that as the restrictions loosen up and, and folks are out getting back to a little bit more of a normal life. Um, 
we're not, it, it, it doesn't feel like a crisis for us to get back into the office. So, um, um, but it, it's, a, it's a day-to-day thing. I'm, I, I wait for the balloon, you know, a lot of people sit around and wait for the, uh, the Cuomo announcement <laughs> or whoever. Uh, I wait for the balloon announcement because he's talking about Suffolk County and that's what I want to know. Right. <laughs> Great. Um, and, and Michael, you guys are in Nassau, but, um, and I'm sure part of what you do is essential. So you may have people that are in your facility on a small scale at the moment, but what are, what are your overall plans and how are you dealing with it? Yeah, so so we went remote uh, about almost 12 weeks ago at this point. It's almost been three months. We were a little bit proactive with it for the reason that we just saw this coming and, and really jumped as fast as we could to make sure our team was safe. And the reason why I was a little proactive was for if, if this was something to spread through our organization, we are a service provider. We have to make sure that our staff is available for our customers no matter what, pandemic, disaster recovery, you name it. We, we have to be there. So, you know, it's definitely been uh, interesting. And we probably, to be honest, we're, we're, we have, you know, almost daily executive meetings. And, and as Tyler mentioned, productivity is great right now. Can't guarantee that's going to remain. But it does look like we are probably going to keep at this uh, potentially indefinitely. Um, outside of the team members that we have to have in the office, because we do have data centers, we do have servers, we need somebody to repair them if they break. But right now, we, we only have a few people in the office at any given time, keeping social distancing. We have PPE gear for them. Uh, but it, it does look like if this continues, then we continue to see the results that we're seeing. And, and our staff is generally enjoying it. You know, we've had conversations with them. They really do like it. They are happy. They're not complaining. Um, we're probably going to keep at this. We're probably going to continue indefinitely adopting more of a remote culture. It's, it's worked well so far. We have the systems and tools in place. We've already been for the last two to three years allowing each employee to work remote one day a week. Uh, so we've, we've adopted or, or kind of learned how that worked a little bit. Five days a week compared to one is definitely a big difference. But uh, right now, it, it seems like it's, it's potentially going to stay this way. And I'm sure some of my employees are on this webinar. So, uh, <laughs> hey, you didn't hear this from us yet, but uh, we might be uh, staying remote a little bit longer. So... Uh, that's that's where we stand right now. That's great, and I I, I applaud both of you for um, coming up with solutions during the crisis. I mean, through Listnet, uh, we also have the digital ballpark, which you can see virtually behind me. I'm not actually there, but uh, and we host some companies there, and I talk to a lot of other companies, and I hear a lot of worry among companies, and it's great to hear you guys be positive and talk about things you've done proactively. Um, what would you say generally to business owners, or ask this to both of you, uh, Tyler, maybe you start, you know, business owners facing challenges and that might be just, you know, things don't look so great. What, what advice would you give them generally during this time? You know, I'd have to try to break that advice up, I think, Paul. Um, you know, there are some business owners, owners that their conditions are, com- are so dire uh, right. in, 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 in the pandemic and with the shutdowns that, I'm not sure that I'm, you know, my personal experiences qualify me to give them um, any, any, any meaningful advice other than, uh, you know, as entrepreneurs, you know, you, you've got to, you've got to, you got to think on your feet and you've got to try to remain positive. You know, if you've you got to kind of optimism is what made you an op- entrepreneur in the first place and kind of go back to that and try to find a way to, um, you know, to do what you can. Um, uh, to get to get to get through this clearly it's hard to pivot some business models uh and for anybody else who's got a business model that's that that's been impacted but yet they're still kind of functioning my suggestion would you know would be to be uh would, would be um be nimble um you know i see um tv ads already for printers uh, you know um instead you know selling um um uh, the types of things I was talking about, signage and other kinds of things uh, for, for, for stores and, and restaurants trying to create new boundaries for, uh, for social distancing. Uh, so there's a printer saying, you know, all right, maybe I'm printing less, you know, menus this month, but, uh, you know, maybe I can print something else in, in, instead. And I think that many businesses have an opportunity to sort of look at the current circumstances and say, what is it that I can do? I mean, I've seen um, and heard stories of, of, of manufacturers, you know, creating uh, PPE 
and masks. I heard that the My Pillow company, for example, is creating uh, is, is using a lot of their assembly line to create um, not not paper but cloth, you know cloth face face masks. And so my my feeling is is that don't be be bold. You know you you this is a, these are unprecedented times and you you got to you got to you got to you take take that word that we use from the startup community pivot you know make be, be prepared to make a fast and hard turn in another direction and don't feel like you're abandoning your original original vision if all of a sudden you feel like you're doing something that's materially different from what you had set out to do it's a new world and you need to adjust and i don't think it's ever going back to complete normal i agree with mike we're gonna we're, we're never gonna go back to everybody in the office every day there's going to be some hybrid model that's going to be created many new dynamics and opportunities I think created by all of this change and it's up to entrepreneurs to respond. Um, so, you know, I, I wish all businesses the best uh, and I certainly don't, I, I don't envy the ones that are in the most challenging, uh, challenging fields at this point. No, thank you. And it's, it's, it's refreshing to hear from both of you, your focus on employees and, you, you know, looking at productivity and being realistic and saying, Hey, it is helping my productivity and, Maybe there is a new way forward. Um, so I think both of you have, have really shown that you can look at things differently. Michael, any any advice as we close out for anyone facing challenging times right now? You know, I, I think Tyler said it great, and it, it depends on the expertise that you're asking. And, and what I have is is more technical, you know, so if you start asking me about restaurants and, and, <laughs> and so on and so forth, how they can survive, I wouldn't have probably really good advice. But I think, you know, Tyler mentioned be nimble, uh, be calm, be creative. You know, it is a time where you can really take that entrepreneurial ideas and, and just try things. You know, I, I, you could do things for very in a cost of ways to just, just try it and give it a shot. You know, you see all these restaurants, you know, they, they're not allowed to have people come in, but what they've done is they've now obviously done uh, delivery through the Uber Eats and the DoorDash, but even restaurants by me are doing these really creative virtual happy hours where they're actually having people come drop off food and drinks to you on a Saturday um, or virtual bar crawls. And, you know, who would have thought to ever do that? And, and now, you know, what's really cool to think about is these are things that people would probably do before the pandemic, but they never really existed. Right. right. You know, you have kids, you have family, you can't leave your house on a Saturday, but it doesn't mean mom and dad don't want to have a few drinks by the, by the pool or, or just enjoy a Saturday afternoon with the kids, but you can't leave. So now these bars and restaurants are now gonna have these really great things you could do at home or all these new businesses that pivoted to, you know, like um, the cooking classes you can go to. They're now, they're now virtual. How awesome is that on a Friday night, whether pre or post pandemic, to get together with your spouse and do a cooking class virtually where they right. send you all the ingredients and somebody teaches you how to cook we didn't do these things beforehand and now it's forcing us to do it. But now we can all turn around and say, wow, pandemic or not, I would do that on a Friday night. My kids are sleeping. Right. I can't do anything. Right? right. So it's really interesting how companies are coming up with very creative new ways to sell. You know, we're, we're all obviously unfortunately experiencing, you know, very crazy and scary time. You know, our unemployment mm -hmm. rates are, are through the roof, unfortunately, but you know, hopefully we'll get back to some normalcy and, and companies coming up with very creative ways to pivot their businesses and sell something new has been really interesting. And, and that's the advice I would, I would give to everybody is just try your best to come up with some creative ways to, to do something else than what you've been used to. I like the idea of the focus on these new businesses and new ideas may hopefully create some more employment opportunities and other things there. Yep, exactly. I agree. Thank you so much. I think, you know, some of these last words, you know, be bold, pivot, you know, be nimble, creativity, and, and, and an excitement for new world opportunities. I think those are some really valuable ideas to give to people during this uh, pandemic and thinking outside of it as well. Um, I do have one question uh, that I wanted to share with you before we said goodbye. Um, and as the professionals here, are you concerned about not being able to make that human to human connection with potential clients and other professional resources and, and also the, the impact of not having that human to human connection between your employees? Is that concerning and, and what, are you, what, are, what are you thinking about in terms of addressing some of those shortcomings from, from the pandemic? Yeah, 
I guess I is that that for for the speakers. I guess I could take. Yeah, I think, uh, Tyler. You yeah, want to take that? Sure. Um, I think you know, um, um, less than three months into it, I don't think you know, and I, and given that that the, all the reasons why folks don't want to go out, mm -hmm. it hasn't been that much of an issue yet, but it's clearly coming, right? So I think people are getting a little bit of cabin fever. I think even though the idea of working remotely is is wonderful, I think that it's, uh, it'll be healthier to have a mix of both in the office and out of the office, so that people can have that sort of uh, you know that opportunity to have a little change of scenery um, and have a collaborative work environment. I mean, the whole concept of Launchpad is that people don't want to work at home necessarily, right? Some folks do want to get out into a a, a vibrant work environment. Um, obviously, those work environments and what they're going to feel like uh, over the next year until you know, maybe we have a vaccine or whatever it is, it's going to be there's going to be maybe some tension in the air. So it might not be that relaxed, relaxing of an environment. But I still think people, will, some people more aggressively than others, will, will find their way back into the workspace. And definitely, people want that 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 face to face interaction as it relates to business travel and other kinds of things. I think that that's going to be longer. Um, I think I'll miss conferences personally. I won't miss. Uh, I won't miss a majority of my business travel. I won't. I personally won't miss. And I know a lot of other folks who, uh, who sort of dread their business travel uh, quite a bit. So, seeing that drop by half or more in the long term, and 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 having a new normal where there's more of this type of collaboration, I don't think is necessarily. Um, a, a bad thing, but it has to be a mix. People will go stir crazy if this is the only way we can interact. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd, I'd love, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to have a virtual happy hour with all of you. But I, but I'd, I'd much, I'd much prefer to, to, to gather at the Listnet happy hour, for example, and uh, and, uh, and, 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 and 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 cheers our drinks actually uh, <laughs> together. But yeah, that's where we are. That's a, that's a really good point. I, I'm sure a lot of people won't miss uh, waiting online and security on the airlines, but you know, with that, there's certainly the, the missing of the human connection. What What about you, Michael, about that question in terms of the human to human connection for your employees and, and clients alike? Yeah, so I, I'll admit I'm a hugger, you know, I'm a hugger. I'm, I'm an emotional person. I, I love that that connection, but it, it has to change a little bit, right? Whether it's for now or the foreseeable future, we're all just going to have to adapt what the new new social means. And you know, we've, we've gotten used to it over the years. We don't realize, you know, 20 something years ago, you didn't text your friend and ask them what they were doing or avoid a phone call and rather just text because you're on the couch watching a movie and you don't want them to interrupt you, but it's okay to text them, but just don't call me. I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to listen to you. You're going to interrupt my show. So I think we've all kind of had these things that we've gotten used to and we forgot that it's still social interaction and we've actually enjoy it. You know, when a friend or a family member doesn't text you anymore, you're like, Hey, What's going on? I haven't heard from you. You don't usually call them, but you probably text them, right? So we're, we have to get used to it. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be different, you know, not having, especially for the services we provide, we generally like to do face-to-face -face meetings with customers. We do tours where they, they, you know, can see the data center and all of that. And what we're doing now is we're actually creating a virtual tour. So we're going to have a virtual tour on our website where you can see our data centers, the whole thing from the minute you walk in our office, we're going to have somebody explaining the tour and you can do a virtual tour and you can we're going to find ways for them to ask questions and it's going to just be a, a, a different experience but it's all possible and, and we all just have to adjust and, and just remember we're in it together it's not it's not just one person it's not just one group we all have to develop this new norm so i think it'll be good at the same rate i think you just need to find ways to adapt to the new norm you know the virtual happy hours aren't the best but at the same rate you know, you find ways to make them fun and creative where you're still getting that interaction. You know, in a couple of weeks, we're doing a virtual happy hour with a scavenger hunt for our whole staff. So you got to go around the house and find some things and bring it back. And whoever brings it back, it's a point you win, you win prizes at the end. So you just got to find ways to just make it interesting and, and still uh, just have fun and, and as best you can. Thank you for that. I think, you know, it's, it's a wonderful way to kind of bring this together and, 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 and an end and talking about that we are all in this together and we're all working together to make things happen during this very challenging time. And, and certainly hearing from the two of you 
about the incredible ways that you're turning really lemons into lemonade and creating help to create um, new ways for people to engage um, with your businesses and beyond um, are really, really fabulous to hear about. And um, it's been a very interesting time spending with you. I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank our uh, wonderful attendees for being here. I hope this was valuable to you. Um, we will be able to send a link to you. Many of you have asked that about being able to have a link of this. So we'll be happy to share that with you down the road. And um, please do reach out. We have websites that I shared um, of egifter.com and webair.com to learn more. And don't forget about ListNet, um, still an important organization to, to bring together, whether that's in person or virtually. Um, and last but not least, thank you from Schnepps Media. Um, we're here to support local businesses and help promote you in unique ways during this uh, very unique time and beyond. So again, thank you all for spending time with us today and uh, wish you all a very safe and healthy and happy happy day week and beyond thanks bye-bye thanks elizabeth thanks everyone. thanks everybody have a good day